Good afternoon, everyone. I see some of you uh, trickling in. I'm just going to give a little bit more time for others to come on in. Hopefully, you're all having a wonderful Tuesday afternoon. For those of you who are already in the webinar, I am going to post the pre event survey in the link. So please, if you have an opportunity as we wait for people to hop on um, to just take this quick four minute survey, it really helps us um, tailor our programs to better suit your needs. Uh, plus, there's an opportunity to be entered into a drawing to win a $50 Visa gift card. So I don't know about you guys, but I could use an extra 50 bucks. If you fill out the pre-event survey and the post-event survey, you will be entered into that drawing. So please go ahead and do that. I'm just gonna give a few more minutes while we wait um, for people to trickle on in. All right, welcome everybody. We've had a few other people hop on, so I'm going to share the pre-event survey link one more time in the chat. Um, please make sure you complete the pre-event survey. It helps us improve our programs and plus you can win $50 uh, Visa gift card. So complete that survey, please. All right, I think I'm gonna go ahead and hop right into a little bit housekeeping before um, we get started. Oops, let me head back there. Um, if you wanna ask any questions throughout this uh, webinar, please use the Q&A function. You'll see um, it's different than the chat. You know, We definitely encourage you all to chat with one another. You can um, send a quick chat message where you're from and what organization you're with. But if you have a question, please use the Q&A function. It will allow us to uh, make sure we see your question and we will definitely try to get you an answer, an answer to your question on the webinar. If we can't answer a question on the webinar, then we will definitely follow up with you um, to get you an answer. And again, we encourage you all to chat amongst each other. Um, one of my favorite parts about joining webinars is that you get to talk to people and network and it's a really cool way to see who's out there who's interested in the same topics that you are. Everyone is on mute and your cameras are off. So um, no, need, no need to worry there. Um, there may be an opportunity after we share our first video um, to actually speak with Dan Nauman. I'm not sure if he will be on. We'll see if he'll be available. Um, we may be able to answer some questions live. Uh, now for the question that's in the chat, that is just the pre, oh, those are both, the post-survey links. Oh, okay. I will get the pre-survey links for you guys. Thank you for that. Oh. oh, those are the post-surveys. Okay. I will enter the pre-survey link um, here in a moment when I uh, let our executive director um, share some information with you guys. But before we get started with that, don't, don't do the post-survey. Do that after the webinar. I'll share the pre-event survey link in the chat box here in a moment. So just to kind of go over what we're doing today, we are doing a farm demonstration event webinar. I am Isa Marie McIntyre. I'm the grants manager here at Farmer Veteran Coalition. Um, we will be speaking with uh, Dan Nauman, who's owner of Nauman Family Farms. Um, he'll be sharing a little bit about uh, cover cropping and crop rotations on his farm down in Oxnard, California. It is a pre-recorded video. Um, Dan may or may not be able to hop on after the video to answer questions live. Um, also following Dan will be Jamie Whiteford, who is the district scientist with the Ventura County Resource Conservation District. 
He will be sharing a little bit about the programs that can help implement some of the conservation practices that you'll see, not only with Dan, but also if you've attended some of the previous webinars, some of the other conservation practices that we spoke about there. Uh, Jamie also has a pre recorded video, and he may or may not be able to hop on um, after to answer some live questions, but if not, we'll definitely get any questions over to Jamie that you might have. But first, our executive director, Jeanette Lombardo, had something she'd like to share. Well, hello there and welcome uh, to our webinar. And I am the executive director for the Farmer Veteran Coalition. And I see the attendee list and I recognize a few of you. So I, I miss you all down there in Ventura County. I've lived in uh, Ventura County and met Mr. Nauman back in, uh, when I moved there in 2006 from the Central Valley. Uh, I moved to Ventura from uh, the Hanford Lamore area and how to learn about a lot of different type of crops um, that we grow there specifically uh, that aren't grown anywhere else in California. So um, Dan's family has been farming uh, in the Oxnard Plains for over 127 years. He's the fifth generation. His daughters, four daughters are the sixth. And now there's a bunch of little ones running around which will be the seventh. So you'll hear from him uh, on all his conservation uh, practices. That's what this grant is for, is with the California Resource uh, Conservation District. Uh, he'll be talking to you about uh, drip irrigation and cover crops and crop rotation and how he uses soil analysis uh, to help throughout uh, the, the processing of uh, the process of planting and harvesting. So um, we, and just like a lot of, uh, a lot of farmers, they are involved very heavily in their communities. Uh, Dan has sat for the last 35 years on the United Water Conservation District, and that's where I uh, came to know him. So he, you can see his passion uh, for water in the video when he talks about uh, some of the techniques they use uh, besides drip irrigation uh, to help with that. So I hope you enjoyed the video, hope you learn a lot and that you uh, try some of the conservation practices out there for our beginning farmers and ranchers uh, that are just now uh, starting their, their journey of being farmers. So Isa, back to you. Thank you, Jeanette. All right, like Jeanette said, we are gonna um, show a video about Dan's farm, but before I get into that, uh, we are going to share a little bit about Farmer Veteran Coalition for those of you who may not be aware of who we are and what we do. And even before that, I'm gonna share a little bit about myself, just so you all know who's talking to you. Um, my name again is Isa Marie McIntyre. I am an army veteran. I served in the army for eight and a half years. I worked on the multiple launch rocket systems. If you have no clue what that is, uh, don't worry. I actually didn't know either when I joined the army at 17, but it sounded cool. Uh, it's actually that piece of equipment that's right there on the screen. I am, a, it's a young, 18 year old me sitting on that piece of equipment. I did two years in the, or eight years in the army. I did two deployments while I was in the army, uh, both to Iraq. I drove a truck while I was there. And I also met my husband on my first deployment and we now have three children. We live in Woodland, California. Um, he's actually a beekeeper up here in Woodland, California. Um, he did get injured in the army on his fourth deployment when he was in Afghanistan. He lost both of his legs and I am his caregiver. And we've been fortunate enough to do uh, legislative advocacy for caregivers and veterans. And um, just very happy to be a part of the Farmer Veteran Coalition team. And I actually became a part of um, FEC. Uh, I was actually a member first before I was staff. And um, FEC has been there to help my husband into beekeeping. And it's just been a really wonderful experience both as an FEC member and um, now working here uh, on staff. So Farmer Veteran Coalition is a, national, is a national nonprofit dedicated to assisting veterans in agriculture. Um, I know that's broad, but we cover all types of agriculture, um, all types of farming and, and all types of scales, and we support all eras of veterans. Um, many nonprofits um, only support post 9-11 veterans. We support all veterans. Um, we've been around for over 10 years. And we operate on two primary beliefs. Uh, the first being that veterans possess skills and abilities um, that can make them successful in agriculture. 
but also that ag offers purpose and it offers uh, opportunity and physical and psychological benefits. So we really operate on those two primary beliefs. We are a membership organization, like I said, uh, membership is free. There are no annual dues or application fees or anything like that. We do represent over 35,000 farmer veterans in all 50 states. So we do have um, quite a few members and um, this past year has just been a, a huge, we've experienced a lot of growth. I think we've added about 10,000 members. So the need is definitely there and we're happy to fulfill it. Uh, part of what we do in our member support services is we provide career counseling for veterans who are transitioning from the military, who are maybe just kind of exploring their options. They're not really sure if they want to get into ag. Um, a lot of times we get calls like that. Um, uh, and a lot of times we have veterans who know that that's exactly what they want to do. So regardless of where they're at in terms of their career planning, we can assist with that. Um, also with business planning, if, you, if there are veterans who get out and they know they want to own a farm business, we can assist with that and um, kind of give them some guidance on how to get started. In addition to that, we have a, a whole database of financial resources that are available. Um, we have our own program that provides small grants to farmer veterans. I'll talk about here in a minute. But we do have a whole database of different financial resources depending on the veteran's location and type of farming and um, what their need is. So if there's a veteran who needs some assistance, they can give us a call and we can help them with that. We also offer mentorship, uh, training, apprenticeships, and internships, and we have membership discounts. So if you are a Farmer Veteran Coalition member, you can see our discount member, our, our discount partners on the screen. We're very grateful to our partners. We appreciate that discount. Um, when you're starting a farm business, anything helps. But essentially we meet the veteran where they're at. So whether they know if they wanna get into farming or they're not sure or anywhere in between, um, we, we can assist with that. One of our two primary programs is our Homegrown by Heroes program. It is the official farmer veteran program of America. And if you look at those photos on the screen, you'll see that that is the Homegrown by Heroes label. So our Farmer Veteran Coalition members have to actually apply for that label. And it just lets the community know that the product that has that label is actually grown by a veteran. Um, there is um, some criteria that needs to be met because we wanna maintain the integrity of that label. Uh, we don't just give it to anyone. Um, the product has, has to actually be grown by the veteran. And if you're interested in that, you can feel free to um, ask questions in the chat, we can answer them or you can reach out. I'll have an email at the end of the slide that I'll share with you where you can reach out and ask any questions. Our second um, pretty well-known program is our Farmer Veteran Fellowship Fund. This is a small grant program. We provide grants anywhere from $1,000 to $5,000 to purchase farm equipment for a um, farmer veteran who owns their own farm business. So we really use this program to just kind of give a little extra boost and get the farmer veterans, um, you know, give them whatever assistance they need to really get their business going. We've awarded $3.5 million um, to 800 farmer veterans through this program. And uh, we actually just closed our, our um, 2022 uh, award cycle back in, in February. So we will be hearing soon about who the awardees are for 2022. And um, we just wanna thank our major sponsors, including Woodaware Project Voted Tractor, Tractor Supply and the Farm Credit System. Um, without those uh, large sponsors, we would not be able to have this program. So we really appreciate their support. And it's funding that goes directly to farmer veterans. In conjunction with our um, fellowship fund program, we have the Kubota Geared to Give program. Um, again, we're incredibly grateful to Kubota for the, our, our partnership with them on this. Um, with our Geared to Give program, it's actually done through our fellowship fund application. And essentially on the application, there is a section where the veteran can select whether or not they need a piece of equipment. If you've ever purchased a large piece of equipment, you know that that comes with a big price tag. Um, we've certainly had to do that on our farm. And so uh, with Kubota, we actually award five pieces of equipment a year through the Gear to Give program. And so these are farmer veterans that are getting these pieces of equipment from Kubota. Um, and it's just a really great help for those farmer veterans. Um, this program has been around since 2015 and we've awarded 31 pieces of equipment to farmer veteran coalition members. So again, we're really grateful to Kubota for that wonderful partnership. 
Our annual stakeholders conference, uh, many of you, if you are familiar with Farmer Veteran Coalition, you know that we do meet regularly. Um, of course, the pandemic shifted that a little bit. We did have a virtual conference in 2020, and then we actually had um, another conference in 2021. So we actually had a conference in person and it was wonderful. And we look forward to seeing you all, hopefully in Oklahoma City, November 13th through 15th for our annual stakeholders conference. Um, registration is not open yet, but if you want to stay in touch with when registration opens, I will share information with you about how to do that here in a moment. Right here. So you can become an FEC member. That's the best way to get information about um, what we are doing. I do know that we have some people on this call who are not veterans. You can still join from our veteran coalition. You can see on the screen right here, um, there's actually an option to join as a veteran or not a veteran. Of course, if you join as not a veteran, you uh, will get our emails and it will tell you when to register for the conference and things like that. You cannot apply for the fellowship fund, Homegrown by Heroes, or receive the membership discounts. But it's really a great way if you're not a veteran, if you want to stay tuned to what we're doing, it's really the best way to do that. So if you go to our website, you'll see on the top left, it has the join button. And then it'll um, pop up with the little screen on the bottom right that you see right there. And like I said, if you're a veteran, you select veteran. If you're not a veteran, you select not a veteran. And it's really the best way to stay in touch with us. Okay, as promised, here is our support email and our support phone number. If you have any questions about anything I've shared, or um, maybe you have some questions about something I didn't get to, you can feel free to reach out to the support at farmvetco.org or the phone number that's on your screen. I will copy and paste that into the chat. So if, we, if I click away from it too soon, don't worry, it will be there. All right, I'm just gonna check real quick and see if there's any questions about what we do. Uh, well, there we go. All right. All right, I'm not seeing any, any questions about Pharma Veteran Coalition, what we do. So I'm gonna go ahead and hop right into Dan's video. Again, um, it, it is a pre-recorded video. I think we have the audio figured out if you were on our first webinar, you know the audio was a problem. Um, we tinkered with it a little bit. I think we have the audio figured out. So uh, don't worry about that. But I'm gonna share Dan's video. And if you have any questions, please again, put it in the Q&A and we will get to them either directly with Dan if he's on the call or um, we'll follow up with you about that question. All right, enjoy. Good morning and uh, welcome to, to uh, Nauman Family Farms. I'm Daniel C. Nauman and uh, we're in Oxnard Camarillo area in the Ventura County of California. And wanted to share with you um, our family background. We're Germans. Our family originated out of Germany and uh, they were Masons at that time, not farmers, but they came out to uh, and they came out with other families to New York and from New York they moved to Texas. In the area they moved into Texas was they gave uh, money to a, to a person to secure farmland in that area and they got there and there's really no real farmland to farm and so they were basically swindled out of their money and the guy disappeared. And the, and the funny part is that's where they should have kept the, the land anyway because that's where the oil is. But uh, after saving up they moved to Chino, California where they heard about the sugar beet expansion an opportunity to farm out in California. And so they uh, moved out and traveled across New Mexico, Arizona to, to California, to the Chino area. And then after several years, uh, they heard about the Oxnard brothers developing sugar beets in the Oxnard Ventura County area. So they moved over, uh, they moved from Chino to the Oxnard area. And at that time, you have to realize, you know, there's a lot of things, there's, they weren't the freeways we have now, not the rail system we have now. And so they came with their the horses and wagons down the Norwegian grade and down the Canal Valley grade, uh, where the University of Challenge University is today. And uh, so after a while, they they uh, saved up enough money and they purchased some property as they worked uh, worked in the area. There were seven brothers and and four sisters at the time. So that makes me the fourth generation, and my daughter that runs our farm office is our fifth generation family farm uh, family that's been in the area. And at that time, it was primarily sugar beets and a lot of alkali ground. And there were artesian wells in this area, so there was a lot of water. The climate was beautiful. And after the sugar beets uh, were going for a while, other crops started developing because the sugar beets helped improve the ground with the alkali base. And then they put in ditches and drains to drain the, the, drain the area. 
and then came the uh, the beans into the area. From beans, they moved into citrus and other crops that we have today. And we've been through a lot of development in our area, like most of the United States, especially California. We went from the sugar beet factory, which brought in the railroad system to expansion, uh, world recognition, because it was the world's largest sugar beet factory at the time. And then we went and started going into World War, world, world War I and World War II, which brought our, our wonderful military folks into the area. We had the Oxnard Air Force Base, we had Point Magoo Navy Base, and we also had uh, Port, Port White Navy CB Base. So we had a lot of influx of uh, military into the area during World War II. And it all came with that, came a lot of families that uh, loved the area, and the city started expanding to, to where they are now. There's about 700,000 folks in our area. And we have, besides ag business and the military, we have a, a very large port Wainimi uh, in, in, uh, infrastructure with bananas and cars and other things coming in up through the port. And that kind of brings us back to our farm. We, if you think back then, uh, when the group came in, about a 30 year acreage, if not more, was developed, was devoted to uh, having uh, feed for your, for your animals, whether it's the horses or, or a stockyard or even mules for the farm. And then from there moved into steam engines, from steam engines to diesels and gasoline powered tractors and, and, and machines. And so in, uh, if you think about the development of irrigation, they went from uh, furrow irrigation to flood irrigation to sprinklers. And then after sprinklers, we moved back, we uh, realized there's a water shortage and water quality issues. So we moved into drip irrigation, many sprinklers, which helped develop a lot of the citrus in our area because of, they could uh, take the mini sprinklers and develop the hillsides and up in Fillmore, Pyro, and even the Camaro area and uh, get a lot of uh, fantastic citrus and, and even avocados. As you can see, we're out in the celery field in the, uh, one of the ranches that we operate under. And uh, to, to my left and to your right is where we're harvesting celery. We're also doing romaine lettuce at this time. And we're harvesting cabbage and cilantro on other locations. So uh, in our area, uh, on, the out, on the crops that we grow, obviously they're not greenhouses. A lot of our plants, uh, we used to, a lot of our plants used to be my seed, from peppers to lettuce, even celery at one point. And now we move everything into a greenhouse where we have high germination seeds, hybrid seeds, that uh, we, uh, for, for example, celery's in the greenhouse from anywhere from 60 to 74, 75 days peppers we, that we're going to be planting next week that we'll harvest in uh, basically August and September. Uh, they put, were put in a greenhouse in January. We're planting them uh, this week, which will be uh, April week of April 5th. So they're in there for a length of time, and we transplant basically most crops that we deal with. The only things that we direct seed would be our cover crops, which is a pea sorghum uh, combo that we grow for about 40, 40 days and get it up to about uh, two to three feet in height, and then we turn that back in for soil amendments. Our crops that we primarily rotate, and it's important for rotation, is uh, our core crops are celery. Uh, we do peppers, sweet and hot. We do uh, cauliflower, uh, some broccoli, uh, cabbage. We do, uh, I'm trying to remember all the things, cilantro. Uh, we, do, we have in the past done the, the kale and collards, and we do romaine lettuce. Those are our primary items that we're involved with currently. And those change, you know, over time, the demand for products change, the, the cost of regions change. We're in a, what we call a high rent district area here. Where our inputs are high. We have, uh, uh, labor's always important. A lot of things we do, it's, there's not a lot of mechanized harvesting that we have available, like they develop in other areas, like for processing tomatoes and, and other crops. Uh, so we're, we relied on what we call skill labor. So from strawberries to raspberries to blueberries to row crops that I discussed, there's a skill on how they harvest and how they, how they grow them. So you, t you can't just take a strawberry person and drop them into a celery crew because there's a skill on how they work together. So it's a, it's a very skilled and um, there's an art and a skill to what they do to make it all work. So basically, uh, you know, it's, uh, we, I mentioned crop rotations. The, and the reason, the, the key part for crop rotations is we have certain times of the year that we ha have certain crops. We, out of 52 weeks out of a year, we have 28 weeks of celery in our district. And then we have a celery-free period, and that's for uh, virus issues and rotation issues. 
So that's why we, we rotate from celery to lettuce to cabbage. Uh, then we do our summer crops, which is primarily peppers, and, and our cover crops. And that helps us with our ground uh, balance. It helps us with our weed control because we have different uh, chemicals we can use for different crops for weeds. It, it helps us strengthen the organic matter uh, base in the soil. And uh, with that, we, we take uh, soil samples before we plant and actually one week before we harvest so we can see what's in the soil uh, to finish the crop off. And then we do a, a lot of st intensive uh, leaf tissue analysis, dry and wet. Uh, we're looking for nitri nit nitrogen levels, phosphate and potassium levels, but we're also looking for all the minerals, the magnesium, the zinc, the borons, and other items that are important. At the same time, we're looking for the salt index that we're dealing with. And with our rotations and our cover crops and a lot of sweet rain, it helps us with our salt index with our crops. And we're looking for to manage our fertilizer needs, where the crop is at, and there's a dry test and a, and a wet test. So the wet test tells us what's, what's going on in percent nitrogen. On the dry test, it gives us not only nitrogen, but also phosphate, potassium, and the other minerals that we discussed. And that gives us a benchmark or a trend how the crop is doing. So over time, we've had these models that we put in place where the, where the best growing zones would be. And as we finish the crop, we don't want to keep putting out more fertilizer. We want to make sure we get the crop where we want to make sure we make a crop, but do efficiently and effectively and use our resources as long as fertilizer, water management, spray management, and so forth to make it work. Okay, so in, in California, there was a, a, a Sigma law passed where each area or each water basin needs to be sustainable. And in our region here, we've been fighting seawater intrusion since the 50s and 60s. And we have a, a very wonderful aquifer system that we have a recharge off the Santa Clara River. We can recharge up to 10 to 14 feet of water per day once we harvest it off the river. And to give you an idea, statewide, the average is three acre feet per day in, in the recharge basins. So with the, with the precious water supply we have, if you go back into the late 80s and 70s, there's a lot of furrow irrigation, some very little sprinklers. Sprinklers came later for a water management tool. Uh, we laser level our fields. We have a lot of fields that are tiled, some ranches are not, and that helps us with the perch zone underneath uh, to get rid of the salts and other items in the soil. We have uh, moved from uh, sprinkler irrigation, from furrow to sprinklers, to drip irrigation, and also many sprinklers. Even in the strawberry world, uh, we've worked with uh, in increased our, our tapes per bed for the plants. We've had many sprinklers to help set the plants when we transplant through the plastic. All that's to, to uh, monitor, not really monitor, but to, uh, re preserve the water supply that we have. And so there's, uh, so we can continue with our crop rotations. Uh, depends on long-term and short-term crops. In the world of strawberries, they're basically long-term crops. So there's just one, one, one crop per, per year on that, on that location. And in the row crop business, it depends on the length of, uh, for example, celery and peppers are, and uh, certain times of the year, uh, because of the day length, uh, cabbage and other crops are long-term crops. Our short-term crops would be like spinach, radishes, cilantro, that, and even lettuce that turn around in, in 45 to 60 days, or in some cases a little longer, like 80 days, depends on the time of the year. So with our short-term and long-term crops, uh, we, we can get a little over two and a half, 2.7 crops a year with our water concerns in our area. We're, right now we're, we're budgeting 1.77 crops per acre because of the water supply and the sigma issues that I talked about. So in the world of sustainable agriculture, uh, not only are we trying to preserve the water and protect the soil with the, with the amendments and rotations, we are looking at, uh, through the Water District, water, United Water Conservation District, we're looking for increased supplies, and we have a partnership with Ventura County Navy Base in developing a well field to treat, uh, uh, basically, uh, a brackish water system to clean up the water, put it back into the system for the cities and for agriculture. At the same time, we, we like a lot of agencies, we have state water that we can purchase into this area, depends on the allocation, and try to preserve the, uh, the water supply in our region, in including, on, including the importance of the environment that has to be protected from fish to other species. Those are all important things that we all have to live with and protect. To give a little more explanation about the water 
process and management that we have. If you go back in the 60s and 70s, we would be using almost four acre feet of water for a celery crop, for example. And, with, and then we went from fur irrigation to sprinklers. That brought it down to another, um, probably closer to three acre feet of water. And now we're with the drip irrigation, we can do the same crop with about 1.9 acre feet of water. So that shows you the importance of what we're doing. And uh, with the drip irrigation, and I mentioned tiling systems earlier, uh, when we don't get a lot of rain with the water management, we, we're primarily watering the zone where the roots are. So we're not really leaching any salts or anything. It, and so that water, the tile system really doesn't run much when we're using drip. The only time it really runs in this area is when we have a sprinkler irrigation going, or not sprinkler, but uh, rain coming in. So rain that we received, like in this year in December, was beautiful. We received over eight, nine inches of rain. The tile systems were running. Everything was doing very well. And then we went to, you know, because we're basically in a drought. We live in a dry area. Our average rainfall in this county ranges from 15 to 17 inches. So um, we haven't really hit that much in this drought cycle that we're in right now. So that's where the drip irrigation is very important in the process of managing the water to protect to get the crop we need to, to harvest and to, to the market. As far as cover crops, we do sprinkle the cover crops and that's to get, uh, basically we, we, we uh, a lot of our crops are put on beds, the, the, cover, the cover crops are not, they're put on flat ground like you would do with, with uh, wheat and sorghum and, and we have a pea mix that we put in and it, uh, we sprinkle that, uh, we probably use we use about uh, three quarters of an inch of water to get them up and moving. And then they're in the ground for about 45 to 60 days maximum. And that helps us with a, a crop of weeds in, in between. It helps us with the soil, keeping it uh, not bone dry, keeps it uh, well nourished, nourished. We're also with the crops we're using, they're very, uh, with the root systems and stuff, with the peas especially, we're putting, uh, we're putting nitrogen and resources back into the ground. And one of the crops I didn't mention is the summer crop would be our light four hook lima beans that we grow. It's not really a money maker, it's almost in the category of a cover crop, but it's, it's a very good rotation for us. Uh, what's happening out here in, today, and this is um, early, early April, we're, there's a celery field behind me. To, uh, we're harvesting celery on this ranch. We are, are basically a production farm that uh, has joint ventures with other folks that do the harvesting and selling for us. And that's because we're not in the market year round. And like I mentioned, we have celery here 28 weeks of the year. And then the other, the other um, balance of the year, they're, they're up in Salinas or they're in Arizona harvesting the crop to supply the, the markets that we have today, whether it's Kruger Foods, whether it's Safeway Bonds, Costco's, Walmarts, and other, other stores. So we are also harvesting romaine lettuce today. Uh, on the other ranches, we're harvesting cilantro. We have some cabbage harvesting going on. And that kind of com completes our spring program. The strawberries uh, operation started back in, for, we planned in September. And that starts harvesting in late December and continues through uh, May. And then from May, the, the fresh market for the strawberries end and we move into the processing, processing world of jam for smuckers and knots and others. Uh, then there's an, what they call a day neutral cycle that's planted in July and harvest October through, through December. So there's really two cycles of the berries in our area. So those are, and then there's raspberries and other, and blueberries and other crops also that are happening. Uh, tomatoes that used to be in this valley, uh, processing and for pole tomatoes, uh, that kind of went away because of competition for labor and inputs. So as you can see, crops do change. You have to look forward to see what, what's, what the need is out there and try to be, be ready for it. In the world of harvesting, the, the only thing we handle ourselves directly would be our pepper harvesting, which goes to Satakoy Foods and to Pick Sweet. Uh, even the four hook lima beans that I mentioned that we do with, with Pick Sweet, they bring in their big machines and they, and they basically harvest 20 acres a day with those machines, it's, it's amazing. Uh, in the world of harvesting for the lettuce, cabbage, celery, and other items like that, uh, they, with our partnerships, since they're in charge of the marketing, they also do the harvesting. And that uh, frees up a lot of our, a lot of our time to, because they have their, their crews that move from area to area. So when they finish Oxnard, they move up to Salinas. From Salinas, they come back to Oxnard. From Oxnard, they go to Yuma, Arizona, and then back to Oxnard and back to Salinas. So there's a process in place that they keep those crews busy and they move with the harvest windows of time.
as far as harvesting, the celery used to be harvested uh, like it is now, but it was put into bins and then it was taken to a shed and then processed and packaged it in, inside, the, inside the shed. That has moved to a lot of uh, our crops are field harvested. So they brought these, brought the machines and they're, they're on transport uh, wheels that are motorized transports that go through the field. And they're basically doing what we used to do by shed. So, uh, and so when you're harvesting, you always have some leftover trimmings and packaging. So that stays in the field and we put that back in the field and, ro and rotate it back in. Kind of, it's like a cover crop in a sense because it's putting the, the leftover residue back in the ground. Before, even the Fort Hook lime is before they had machines, they would take the, the whole plant, they'd, they'd harvest, cut it with the knives, take the whole plant into the machine, into the, into Oxnard and process it. And then they bring all the, tra uh, all the, the green trash and pods and stuff back to the field to spread it. Then they came up with machines to go through the field to do the same thing. And since then they've they improve the machines and how they work, and it's it's uh, it's amazing process. Just like they have done in the in the processing tomato world, they used to take them in bins, take the bins into the to the processing plant. Whether it's uh, and then then they moved from there into harvesting the tomatoes right off the plant, put them into big gondolas, and transport those to the to the processing facilities. So when they when we leave, the, when the, when the um, so when they're harvesting right now, the box never touches the ground. You get a lot of joy in, uh, or at least I do, and I think you will also, is uh, working and seeing things grow. And uh, it's, you know, you can, you can only do so much with an iPhone, so much with a computer. There's only so many things you can do with accounting. But when you watch something grow and develop, and, you, and uh, we kind of laugh, there's things when, when crops have some trouble, we try to, in our world, we try to nominize it to make it better, to get, to get the best result we can. And that's, re that's really rewarding. And it's, you know, you can't, you, frankly, you got to, uh, working long and hard hours is, 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 um, is important, but you want to work smart also. You want to have a good group of folks around you to, for resources, whether it's family, whether it's your foreman, whether it's your guys that are helping you in the field. It's, it's, it becomes a family. So the guys have been with us in our operation, have been with me since 1990, 91. And uh, some have retired and we bring in new folks and kind of work them into our family of a business. And it's, uh, there's a joy there because we, uh, it's, it's uh, even in even the, my neighbors that have citrus and avocados, their pace is a little different. You know, they're planting trees that are two or three years old uh, from the nursery. They would take another four to five years to get in production, and then they're in production for 20 years. So it's not like you just rotate and change crops. So in the tree business, you've got a it's a commitment for you know for decades to make it work. At the same time, you've got to realize what in your area what is the best crop currently and looking forward what, what may be better uh, coming up that you can enjoy and hopefully uh, not just practice making money, actually make some money at it. But at the same time, the joy is uh, being outside. There's days where, where I don't go to the office because there's a lot going on with the folks and how we're harvesting and what we're planting and trying to make sure there's no mistakes and, and get it done right. It's, it involves seeing the nurseries, how the plants are doing the nursery, how even they're germinating, that tells us what's, how it's gonna harvest in the field, how it's gonna grow the field. We're always looking for new varieties. We're looking for, for different ways to do things nutrient-wise. It's not just all chemical fertilizers. We do a lot of, of uh, biochemistry materials that we mix with the fertilizer to improve the root formation and the soil at the same time. As you're looking into where to start, what to do to grow things, look where the market is, whether you want to focus on a farmer's market, do you want to uh, team up with, with a shipper and a packer that has resources for sales? You have to kind of look at the area that you're in, what your resources are, what your weather and all the combinations are, and choose what, uh, what you want to start with. And uh, you know, no matter what you do, it's every, life's a, every day it's a different decision. Like, I mean, in this area right now, we're sitting here 65, 70 degrees, in three days, we're going to be 90 degrees. So we're going to have a 25 degree swing. And some weather dictates a lot of what we do. When we irrigate, how we irrigate, when we spray, how we harvest. Uh, seven days ago, we had an inch of rain. 
And so um, it, this, we are doing this now where it's dry. We couldn't do it last week because we'd be in the mud today. So looking at what you want to do and how you want to do it, growing, is, growing is, is probably the simplest thing to do once you find the variety and the areas uh, that you're in, what you can do. It's more what you do after it. How do you get it to, how do you get it to market? Who are you, who you going to work through to get it done? And how much do you need to supply? So it's, it's kind of a thing. You don't, you know, nothing says you have to have 20 acres of anything. You can have five acres uh, with four different plantings for that 20 acres. So it's, it's, and a lot of things that we do are mapped out seriously months and months ahead of time. You know, the pepper program that we have this summer, we talked about it in November when we were just finishing last year's season. What is the, what's the, what's the market going to be? What's the demand going to be? What, what products should we be doing in the world of processing? On the fresh market world, it's the same thing. It's uh, the weather can swing to a crop that makes you a thousand boxes per acre, if the weather changes on you, or there's an issue for quality, you can be down to four or five hundred boxes per acre. So you have to understand, in the world of budgeting, you have to figure out what your cost per unit is, what your inputs are, and figure out how you're going to move it and sell it and get and get the money back after you harvest. You know, I, no matter what schooling you have, there's nothing uh, more memorable than having life experiences, okay? So whether it's the joy of, of holding your daughter or your son from the hospital or bringing him home to the joy of being married and other things in your life, uh, the, the, we all have options, okay? And uh, the option is uh, I'm, I'm staying in this business so I can hand it off to my daughter and her family. So that's kind of where I've been. And my dad and my uncles did the same for us. So we have the opportunity. We don't have to take it, but once we make a commitment, we, we try to make it work. And we've had a lot of crop changes. And we've had some real challenges, uh, whether financially or weather-wise, those things do happen. And uh, that just makes you a stronger person. And, uh, and we have a lot of faith in God in our, on our side of the business, and he's in charge. And I, we just pray that he does the right thing for us and doesn't laugh too much at us and gives us a chance to keep moving forward to, to, so he can bless us and we can bless the people around us. That's how I feel. In, in, in any business you do, it, it, I mean, it could be as simple as a bicycle shop, okay? You have to, you have your assets, your resources, and then it's all involved with sales and understanding what your bottom line is, what your, it's, it's, it's all cost related, and what we look at is cost per unit, okay? So in that business world, you've got to, uh, things are changing, like right now we're dealing with a lot of fuel issues, fertilizer prices, everything has just moved up, the transportation side of the world. Uh, is extremely challenging. I mean, we're, our, our cost in January for red diesel to where it is now is a dollar dollar eighty five cents difference, and we're using you know we're using two three thousand gallons of diesel per week, so that's a big swing on, on what your budget you think you have to work with and what your returns are. So we're hoping on our partnerships that they realize that and the prices that we receive uh, make that all work. So. Percentage-wise, I'd probably say I, I spend, it's really 50-50, okay? There's times it's not always 50-50, it can be a 70-30, but the next week it's 70-30 the opposite direction. So you cannot, you cannot, uh, it's simpler just to be out here and not worry about anything as far as money, but you gotta make it all work. You gotta have a cash flow process. You have to understand where, if things are changing uh, on the other side, are we gonna be able to make sure it works? So. Uh, the business side of it uh, is still hands-on because you're still relying on other people with, with better skills than you have. And that's what I want to share is you don't have to know everything. You just have to make sure you have people around you to make it a complete package. So whether you have an indirect person that could be your CPA or an indirect person that helps you write your leases and your contracts through, through an attorney or a friend uh, or a family member or a neighbor, you, you do not have to do it all yourself. You're foolish if you think you can do it yourself. You still have to be the ramrod to make it work, but you have to coordinate and be the orchestrator to make sure it happens. I would add, you know, when, when you, when you uh, in, a, in a lot of areas, you take like Orange County in, in California, it, there, was a, there was a lot of uh, agriculture in that area, and over time it, it became no agriculture, basically. And so, it, uh, when you have an opportunity like you do to buy a house, you want to be able to eventually 
pass it on to your children or sell it or and move somewhere else. And um, when you're when you're owning farm property, okay, if you're it's it's also an investment, but you don't you don't want to lose that investment. And a lot of times you've just got to make sure that you have reserves available to make it happen. And when you're driving down the road and you're seeing whether fields of wheat or corn or celery or strawberries, it looks very nice because you're driving by at 20, 40, 60, 70 miles an hour. But when you really slow down and, and see what it takes to make it work and what it, and the process is, it, it's a long-term commitment. So a lot of crops in a lot of areas are one crop per year, sometimes one and a half, depends on what's going on with weather. So you have to make everything count. And it does look, I love seeing celery fields. I love seeing it done. And so you think about it, you finish do, doing your budgeted yield, and then you start all over with the next crop. Okay, so it's, you do everything you can to make it work, and then you're doing it right back again. So it never ends. So I just want to I, I just want to put a big thank you out to all the veterans and, and what you've done for to keep us safe and protected. And truly, God bless you for everything you've done. And hopefully, we this is helpful. And and feel free to contact me at any time. And uh, there'll be contact information afterwards if you need some support or ideas. And if I don't have them, I'll find somebody that can help you. Okay, great. Um, Dan is not able to join us, but we are very appreciative of him uh, allowing us to film on his farm. And also he did allow us to share his contact information. So for those of you who have a question, who aren't able to get your question answered today, you can feel free to reach out to Dan. Um, he said he'd be happy to either answer the question himself or connect you with someone who can. Um, however, we do have someone on the call who is with the extension office. Um, ben, welcome. Thank you for hopping on. Can you hear me, Ben? Yes, I can. Can you hear me? Hi. Yes, we can hear you. Sorry to put you on the spot, but uh, someone told me that you were kind of a, an expert in, in these matters. So I just figured I'd ask you some questions if you're okay with that. Oh, go ahead. I'll try and answer them. Sure. No pressure. If you can't answer them, you know, yep. Yep. no worries. Um, so Ariana asked, is it economically convenient to do transplanting instead of direct seed to save money on weed control? You know, that is a really good question because anytime you have the soil exposed, something's going to grow there. And it's either the plant you're putting in there or it's going to be something that blows in. So one of the reasons for doing transplants is that you accelerate the, the harvest period, but um, you're occupying the land faster than the weeds can. So it's, it's, a, it's a really good way to do weed control is by doing transplants. Wonderful, thank you so much. And then uh, we only have one other question. And that question is, when crop planning, what are some resources to use to research suitability and profitability for one's own area? <laughs> so listen to Dan Nauman. It's what is your market? What is out there? Where are you going to be selling? You know, find out what your market wants. And then if you're in Ventura or along the coast here, you can grow just about anything. You can grow wheat, you can grow cotton, you can grow citrus, you can grow, I don't know what you can grow, but you can do it. And so it's the market that determines it. And, um, you know, it's it really, it's, you've got, you have to figure out what that market is and what you're willing to sell into. So, you know, we have cost benefit studies that are um, available at each one of our county offices. 
for the typical crops that are grown. Um, but these are typically, you know, the, the more commercialized crops. And mm -hmm. if you're trying to get into a niche market, um, figure out what that niche market it wants, and then you can grow into it. That's Perfect. not an, but it really, it's the most critical thing is Dan Nauman said it and every grower will say it. If you want to stay in business, figure out what your market is. What does your client want? What does your customer want? And grow for that person. Absolutely. It makes perfect sense. Thank you so much. I appreciate you, uh, you know, kind of put you on the spot here, but I appreciate you hopping on and, and sharing some of your advice with us. Okay, next we're going to go ahead and um, go into Jamie Whiteford's presentation. Again, this was a pre-recorded um, video. Um, Jamie Whiteford is the district scientist with the Ventura County Resource Conservation District. He has a PhD in soil and water science. Um, he's been with the um, Ventura County Resource Conservation District since 2011. Uh, he's managed uh, numerous projects related to soil health, climate change, and just ag in general. And we're very happy to have Jamie hop on and share a little bit about the programs that are um, mostly specific to California. I know we have a few people on the call that are outside of California. So um, he does provide some information about how to reach out to uh, various programs in your local area. So without further ado, I'm gonna share Jamie's presentation. Hello, everyone. Give me a moment while I get everything set up here. All right, hopefully everyone can see my screen. Probably should switch. Hold on one second. This one here. Okay, so hopefully this one will um, show up. So, um, hi everybody. Sorry for the. Uh, sorry for me just talking to myself. Um, my name is Jamie Whiteford. I am the district scientist with the Ventura County Resource Conservation District, and um, I want to thank. Um, I want to thank the veteran farmers for inviting me to speak. Um, and I apologize that I can't be there in person. I actually have a field event scheduled for tomorrow. Um, I'll try to, to join by call from the field. Um, but in lieu of, of being able to present, I thought that probably the best thing to do would be uh, just provide a Zoom recording. Um, I hope that you find it, it useful. Um, so my name is Jamie Whiteford. I'm the district scientist at the Ventura County Resource Conservation District. A lot of what I'm gonna discuss um, while it is going to be kind of specific to the Ventura County Resource Conservation District, um, I'm hoping that a lot of the information will actually also translate to your, your area um, and that uh, there's a lot of overlap between what I'll discuss here and um, the resources available uh, wherever it is that you farm. So um, as I said, my name is Jamie Whiteford. I'm the district scientist here at the Ventura County Resource Conservation District. And my goal today is really just to introduce you to your local RCD. Um, and by virtue of that, um, hopefully introduce you to a broad spectrum of uh, resources available to you. And there we go. All right. <laughs> So I outlined the presentation that I'll be giving today. I um, just want to give a brief introduction to myself and um, my district. And then I want to talk about uh, RCD structure and the partners that we work with, um, overview of our mission, overview of our priorities, um, sort of introduce some projects that we work on. Um, then I want to get into funding opportunities um, that you sh should be aware of. And then uh, next steps that help us help you. Um, so about me, um, I've been 10 years, well, 11 years now, I guess, with the district. Um, I focus, my work focuses on ag projects and ag-related research. 
um, which actually covers a great deal of stuff um, because ag lands, in addition to doing you know traditional agriculture, they also um, are land stewards and they do a lot of um, carbon farming. They do a, a lot of other things that isn't just related to food production. Um, I've got a background in soil and water science uh, from University of California, Riverside. And I am a proud husband of a wonderful, beautiful wife and a father of a former Marine, um, did four years, now is um, seeking his associate's degree. And then my youngest is uh, a welder. So a very proud family of um, young sons who made good choices about us. So the Ventura County RCD is what's considered a local unit of, of government. Um, and this is true for all resource conservation districts. Um, and we're considered a local unit of government uh, under the Public Resources Code of the state of California. Um, the Ventura County Resource Conservation District isn't alone in this distinction. That we're one of about 100 RCDs. And all of um, the RCDs are sort of uh, uh, under the, the guidance, if you will, of a larger California Association of RCDs that kind of handles um, some of the lobby lobbying um, on the RCDs behalf and also some large scale um, block grants that they can apply for um, that thing then can be used for other local RCDs. Um, so as a local unit of government, that doesn't mean that we have any specific uh, regulatory authority or anything like that. Um, RCDs um are not uh, able to tell you what to do and we are only able to assist you in whatever it is that you want to do uh, so a little bit about um our rcd uh, we're a special district like all rcds uh, we have a certain jurisdiction if you will um, in our case our jurisdiction is uh, a mirror um, of uh, our county's boundaries so within our county's boundaries, we are able to pursue the activities that support our mission. And our mission is in resource conservation. And I'll get into that a little bit later. Um, the role of the RCDs um, as it fits within the partners, uh, such as funders and such as landowners, is a, is a critical one. Um, so you as landowners, um, whether you're a farmer, in your case, or whether it's a city or whether it's a other you know, NGO um, who has a resource concern that they'd like to address, um, y'all could apply for funding. Um, and in many cases, you should apply for funding directly from funders uh, that you know, might be giving you technical or financial assistance to be able to mitigate whatever that uh, issue or challenges that you have. And as a landowner, um, or as an NGO, could go to funders at the local or the state or the federal level. Um, but oftentimes, um, seeking funding is time consuming and the process could be, you know, a little bit convoluted. Um, and so it can, you know, be a barrier to landowners uh, efficiently and effectively ask, accessing those resources. And so that's sort of where the RCDs come into play. So um, RCDs are, at least in the case of the Ventura County RCD, um, funded entirely by grants, well, almost entirely by grants. We have a small stipend from our county because they like to support our work, um, but you know, we go after grants um, that we then administer and provide to landowners or um, other organizations uh, so that they can achieve the work that they, they need to do. So the way it works is that, um, Landowners will typically come to the RCD because the RCD as a um, local unit of government um, has the authority and the capacity uh, to go after funding um, that's provided by local, state, or federal um, level agencies. And um, the reason that the landowners often come to us uh, to work with them is because you know, we work in their area. So we're known to them um, we've worked with, you know, landowners uh, for a long time. You know, our our district is around for 70 years or or so, and, and even longer than that, actually. 
and so we're trusted because um, we, you know we've worked with all of these um, individuals or organizations and you know over the time that we've sort of um, done what the district does in terms of uh, implementing projects or seeking funding for projects we've learned how to go about it efficiently and effectively and so we're capable um, in being able to secure funding for whatever those priorities are so the way it normally works is um, rcds will work with landowners to apply for funding uh, and then that funding will then be funneled to the landowners um, to support whatever their needs are and then of course the rcd is supported um, by being able to administer that grant on behalf of the landowner. In terms of sort of our internal structure, um, uh, as district scientist, I'm considered uh, an RCD staff. Um, so my role is to work directly with partners, work directly with farmers, um, and identify what those resource needs are, uh, and then find an appropriate grant that would provide assistance and then write the grant um, along with the with the landowner um, and then once the grant is funded assuming it is then we would implement the project that the the uh, landowner was seeking to get funding or technical assistance with um, however staff answers to our executive director so our executive director uh, handles sort of the grant administration as well as the fiscal um, matters, so invoicing and things like that. Um, and then both staff and the executive director are, um, are will answer to our board of directors. Um, we have seven directors. Um, our board is comprised of, um, you know, landscape architects, uh, um, researchers, and then ranchers and farmers. So um, our board of directors are either appointed by the Board of Supervisors or um, they are elected. Um, and they all are, you know, um, local to our area um, so that, you know, they're serving their, their communities that they're um, embedded within. Uh, in terms of our um, partners that we work with, uh, this is quite a busy slide, um, but all I meant to demonstrate here is that you know, on the local and the state and the federal side, we work with all kinds of different conservation partners as well as funders. So, you know, locally we work with um, Farm Bureau, we work with University of California Cooperative Extension, you know, we work with land trusts, et cetera. Um, at the state level, we work with funders like the Wildlife Conservation Board um, at the state of California, the Department of Conservation, state of California, um you know california department of food and agriculture california fire safe councils etc um and then at the state level i mean at the federal level we work with you know uh, again a number of different partners um, examples include like the united states fish and wildlife service um epa uh etc so um the point being is that we work with uh, a number of different funders and so again it goes back to being capable and aware of opportunities that might um, be useful for you um, in um, mitigating whatever issue you may have or in um, achieving whatever goals you may have i want to um i want to kind of talk about a particular project um, that fits within our mission um, but first i'll go ahead and just read our mission statement so our mission is to collaborate with landowners government agencies and willing partners to facilitate the conservation and restoration of ventura county's natural resources for current and future generations this is our mission statement but it's going to be very similar to the mission statements for um, all the other 100 rcds um, in california um, and i want to talk about this particular project so there's a map that you see in front of you um, this is a project that um, the landowner you know has been a partner of ours for for quite some time and um our relationship goes way back, um, but most recently we um, worked with them to secure a number of different funding uh, opportunities. And so I, I kind of want to walk through them because they're they're relevant to this to this audience, I think. So 
um, several years back, we started working with them to secure funding. Um, and what they were doing at the time is they were converting uh, some of their area from intensely cultivated row crop over to organic avocado. And so uh, what they wanted to do is they wanted to apply for funding um, so that they could protect their um, new avocado trees from wind damage. And so they worked with us um, and we applied for funding um, through the California Department of Food and Agriculture's Healthy Soils Program. And the goal there was to secure funding so that um, the, that money could be used to put in a windrow. So we got that funding for them. So they were able to put in two windrows of uh, native willows to help uh, protect their new trees from wind damage. Uh, after that was secured, uh, we followed that up with uh, an additional application to a separate funder. Uh, we applied to the Department of Conservation, and the goal seeking funding through the Department of Conservation was to put in uh, additional pollinator habitat, keeping in mind, again, that this is an organic avocado operation. Uh, so we secured funding through the Department of Conservation to put in um, pollinator habitat. So these were native uh, flowering species um, ranging from uh, annuals uh, such as milkweed uh, up to perennials such as toyon, et cetera. And these were to complement the windrows. So uh, we, in addition to the hedgerow plantings, we also sought funding to improve the irrigation system. Specifically, we wanted to replace their filter station and upgrade their plumbing um, to the filter station because in order for us to support both the willows and the, um, and the hedgerows, we needed to have um, uh, adequate irrigation and specifically we wanted to avoid any, um, any plugging of the system. So we wanted a new filter um, this is from groundwater, relatively shallow groundwater. And so um, we were able to get that funding for them. And so they got uh, they got uh, some significant upgrades to their irrigation system in addition to the hedgerow planting. And then to follow that up, we um, we saw an additional need for further irrigation improvements, storage tanks, um, pump improvements, et cetera. So we applied to the California Department of Food and Agriculture sweep program which is the state water efficiency and enhancement program and we were able to secure funding for that so um, they'll be able to put in some soil moisture sensors so they can track the irrigation uh, and they also will get further improvements to the irrigation system beyond um, what was provided through the department of conservation so this is just i think a great example of how things can stack and if you work with the resource conservation district and you have a vision for what it is you would like to see um, the goals you'd like to see your operations achieve, uh, then you know we can go about doing that by um, finding adequate funding resources to help you achieve those goals. I want to um, go over some of the other projects that we have um, that align with the RCD's mission and particularly our strategic priorities. And the reason I do this is uh, I want to do this is because um, you know we RCDs do a lot of different things. Um, and again, I'm focused on agriculture because that's simply where I fit in best at this particular district. And I have colleagues who do restoration, etc. We all work together, but you know, um, in this in this kind of um, there's so much work to be done that it's, it's good to have a sort of a, a more of a focus. And so my focus is on agriculture, but uh, we do a whole bunch of different things beyond that. So um, our priorities are water resources, fire preparedness, soil and climate resilience, invasive and resistant species, land resource management, and wildlife habitat. These are just bullet points that are pulled out of our five-year strategic plan. Um, and ultimately, you don't see that these will deviate much in the future. Um, but this sort of bullet list of strategic priorities is going to mirror what many of the RCDs are seeking to do, um, are already doing. And um, it sort of establishes our goals. And with these goals in mind, then we have um, you know projects that we go after to sort of um, address these priorities. So um, you know we have a, a program that helps um, landowners with irrigation and nutrient management um, um, uh, goals. We um, have projects that 
you know, will help harden the landscape to protect uh, structures or landscapes against wildfires. Um, we're interested in how um, practices that occur on ag lands um, impact climate. So, you know, is there carbon sequestration going on? Uh, is there greenhouse gas emissions going on? Um, we're interested in, in ensuring that we uh, eliminate invasive and resistant species so we can reduce pesticide use. And we have a particular focus on um, a flammable um, invasive weed that uses a lot of water in, um, in riparian areas, and that's a rhododonax. So we have a very robust program of trying to eliminate that from our watersheds. Um, we want to make sure that we do enough research uh, to be able to see what are good practices. And so, you know, in our land resource management um, priorities, uh, we're looking at what kind of stewardship practices can happen uh, to protect against erosion or to protect against, um, you know, leaching of nutrients and, and water quality impacts. And then wildlife habitat is, is also important um, and is one of our priorities. So in addition to the pollinator habitat that I discussed earlier, you know, we are also doing, um, you know, more specific things like uh, monarch um, overwintering habitat restoration. Uh, the picture that you see at the top of the slide is from a, a overwintering, historic overwintering site. And in this case, our volunteers are putting in a, a second line of eucalyptus to assist with um, having a, 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 an area that's protected from wind. So when monarchs are in the area, they can harbor in there. Um, uh, so they have can persist throughout the winter um, when the breeding and migratory um, season comes around in the spring. So I, I want to circle back to some more specific um, resources that you should be aware of, um, and that uh, you know is is really pretty much tailored to probably what your needs are. And I discussed this earlier, and this is the California Department of Food and Agriculture's Healthy Soils Program. I mentioned this uh, in one of the other um, projects that we had. Um, this one paid for windrows. Uh, the Healthy Soils Program, it's um, administered by the California Department of Food and Agriculture, and the focus of the HSP program is on carbon and climate. Um, comes about every year, usually opens in the fall and the winter. Um, there generally are um, individuals as part of organizations that can offer you assistance um, in the application process or provide you technical assistance um, if you're awarded funding. Um, so you should really uh, be mindful of that. Um, you can always look up CDFA HSP program information on the web. So, um, you know, you can Google that or use whatever browser you like to get more information of, about the program itself. Um, in our case, in our area, which, you know, I consider to be Santa Barbara County and Ventura County only because um, I, we work very, very well with our, our city in Santa Barbara County. Um, you know, the Healthy Soils Programs pays for soil-based uh, practices like compost and hedgerows. Um, and so you can see this list of projects that were funded ranging anywhere from $20,000 or close to $21,000 up to almost $100,000 to do a variety of different projects that, you know, help conserve soil, help build soil, health, um, you know, and help conserve water and all those types of things. Uh, so um, if any of these practices are of interest to you, then just be mindful that the Healthy Soils Program it could be an option for you to consider to help um, you achieve these, these goals. Similarly, um, I discussed earlier the SWEEP program. Uh, SWEEP is, uh, again, it's the funding through SWEEP is provided through the California Department of Food and Agriculture just like HSP. The way that the RCDs are involved is that oftentimes we're the ones who can provide you the assistance needed to successfully apply for the, for the program. Um, and then also we can usually assist you uh, with uh, implementation or we can assist you with um, other technical resources. Um, now, unlike HSP, uh, SWEEP has a different focus um, and it's on water and energy. So um, while HSP focused more on soil-based practices, um, the SWEET program focuses on practices that conserve water and reduce energy use. So things like putting in flow meters so you can um, better schedule your irrigation uh, volumes. 
um, soil moisture sensors and other technologies that allow you to monitor your soil moisture so you have better control of your irrigation uh, timing. And then um, also if you have an inefficient pump, um, then you can get funding to uh, convert over to a more efficient pump. And again, this will help with, um, with climate mitigation uh, and energy use reduction. Uh, much like HSB, the SWEET program opens in fall, winter. Um, so please be mindful of that time frame and this program. Uh, and again, you can always do a, a, a search CDFA suite to get um, information about when that's opening up. And then uh, I do want to make sure that you are well aware of that. I mean, I've been talking about uh, resource conservation districts, but one of our, our fabulous conservation partners is the uh, Natural Resource Conservation Service. Um, sometimes it's very confusing because often RCDs and NRCS are in the same office and you really wouldn't be able to tell the difference between them. And so oftentimes people think we're the NRCS or they think they're the RCD, um, but just be aware that we're, we're <coughs> excuse me, we're separate organizations with similar um, conservation missions. Um, so RCDs are local unit of governments, NRCS is, uh, a, I'll call it a division of the United States Department of Agriculture, which is a federal level um, entity, of course. So um, the great thing about NRCS is that they are local, even though they are funded through, um, through USDA and ultimately through the Farm Bill, um, but they're local, so they understand your needs just like we do. Uh, one of the more popular programs that NRC has is their Environmental Quality and Incentives Program, or EQIP. Um, EQIP is great because it addresses any number of different resource concerns. Um, if you're interested in, in EQIP, you can apply uh, year round. It's on sort of a rolling basis. So if uh, for whatever reason um, you get in late, you can't apply for the first round, <clears throat> you'll come up for consideration in the second round. Um, there's usually a, there's going to be a local RCD, local NRCS office somewhere around you. So, um, you know, ours is. Uh, ours is in Oxnard Harbor here in Ventura County, um, and our local district conservationist or local DC is Don Athman. Um, so if you're in this area, this information is relevant to you. If you're not in our area, however, uh, again, look up NR NRCS and um, find the, the nearest office next to you and get in contact with your local uh, district conservationist. Um, so I am nearing the end of my, my presentation. I, I've already run over, I think, <laughs> quite a bit. So if you're, if you're interested in learning more about financial and technical assistance, please feel free to email me. There's my uh, email uh, information there, um, or reach out to a local RCD uh, if I'm just outside your area. Um, you can reach out to your local RCD also and sign up for their newsletter. <clears throat> that'll, that'll keep you aware of upcoming opportunities. Um, as I indicated earlier, please be, be mindful of CDFA opportunities. A great way of knowing what's coming is to sign up for their notifications. Um, reach out to your local R, uh, NRCS. Sorry, I keep saying RCD. Reach out to your local NRCS, um, your local district conservationist. See if you can get some information about EQIP and just start the conversation about your, uh, your resource concerns. Um, if you have a local farm bureau, please sign up for that. Uh, their newsletter so you can um, keep abreast of what they're up to. Um, and then if you have a cooperative extension office near you, um, please make sure to reach out to them as well. Um, they can offer you, you know, technical support. They can help you um, figure out what might be going on in terms of your operations. If you've got pest issues or if you've got, um, you know, leaf chlorosis or something, they can help um, steer you in the right direction to address those, those challenges. Uh, meanwhile, please help us help you. Um, it's good for you to reach out to us um, with some specific uh, operational needs in mind um, so that we can sort of start a conversation about that and then go from there. So give some consideration to what you feel your operational needs are. Where do you want to be in another year, another two years? Um, and it's not just sort of operational uh, needs um, that you you should only focus on. Please be mindful of what your environmental goals are. Maybe you want to do a little bit more pollinator habitat. Maybe you want to build up your soil health, uh, in addition to be able to use some of the standard conservation practices to you know, reduce your, your irrigation needs. Um, 
And then ultimately, what are your land stewardship objectives? I mean, how do you want the land to look? Um, and what are the kinds of things that you would like to do to achieve that vision um, as a land steward? Um, these are all things that can sort of help us understand where you are now, where you want to be later. Um, going back to that previous example, um, by understanding where you are and where you need to be um, and what your challenges are, we can be better positioned to be able to stack those resources in the most um, sensible way to get you to your, your final goals um, for your operation. And so with that, I've um, gone on half an hour, much longer than I probably should have. I apologize about that. Um, but again, first, thank you so much, everyone, for your service. Um, I'm very appreciative of that. And I also just want to, um, to thank you for your time and your attention, and your patience, um, <laughs> sitting through this long Zoom call uh, or this Zoom meeting. I hopefully will be able to join, as I indicated earlier, to answer any questions. But feel free to reach out. And again, as I said, um, make sure to be reaching out to other conservation partners, not just the, the RCDs. And so with that, I'm gonna sign off and I'm gonna try to do this gracefully, but um, I'm not sure that I'll be able to do that. <laughs> so uh, thank you everyone again for your time and attention. Wonderful. Well, unfortunately, Jamie is unable to join us. Um, I know he had he had wanted to join us, but you know he's out there working in the field. So uh, we appreciate Jamie sharing that video with us. And um, all of this uh, this webinar series was actually uh, possible because of a California Association of Resource Conservation District grant that Farmer Veteran Coalition has received. So we appreciate them um, for this funding. And also, you know, thank you to Dan Nauman with Nauman Family Farms. We appreciate him sharing a little bit of uh, what he does on his farm. And Randy Ryan was actually the um, person who filmed at Dan's farm. So we appreciate Randy for filming. I am going to put the post event survey in the chat. Um, we ask again that you please complete the post event survey. Um, let us know, you know what we can do better, um, what you liked about this webinar series. And uh, we definitely use that information to make program changes. So we appreciate that information, um, but also you can win a $50 gift card. So if you complete both the pre and post survey, you get put into a uh, raffle to win a $50 gift card. So if there are no questions, I don't see any in the chat. If there are any questions about anything that we saw today, anything, any questions about Farmer Veteran Coalition and the work we do, um, now is your last chance. Okay, I'm not seeing anything. So I really appreciate you all uh, attending this webinar. Um, this is the final webinar in our webinar series on uh, resource conservation. Um, you will receive a recording. It will show up in your inbox tomorrow morning. And you also have another link to the post event survey. So if you don't get a chance to do it now, you can do it then as well. But thank you all for joining us. We appreciate you attending and I hope you have a wonderful day. <laughs>